over a quarter of a million Pacific Islanders call New Zealand home. I'm a bit embarrassed to say it, but I know very little about the country and the cultures they come from, which is why I'm off on a voyage of discovery across the Pacific. Samoans are the largest group of Pacific Islanders in New Zealand, which probably explains why I have a lot of Samoan friends. Yet, I know very little about what helped shape them. The first thing that strikes me on the way into the capital, Apia, is the wealth of beautifully manicured gardens. I would go so far as to say that this is about the most picturesque piece of road I have ever had the pleasure of driving on anywhere in the world. Apia itself reminds me a lot of a small New Zealand town, albeit with a better climate and far more colourful buses. But in the midst of this modern township, an ancient Samoan ritual is being undertaken. A traditional tattooist is at work in an open-air whale on the Apia waterfront. What kind of design is this, Peter? A traditional one? Yeah, this is the um, traditional malu, Samoan girl's traditional tattoo. We call it mugu. 17-year-old Mere Eni and her family have flown from American Samoa to have her leg tattoo, or malu, done by Peter. There must be a lot of mothers around the world who'd be quite horrified their daughters were getting a tattoo. Oh, oh. Oh, Early European sailors actually mistook Samoan tattoos for elaborately embroidered pants. So what, what would uh, this particular tattoo, what, what would its sort of meanings be? Well, Samoan tattoo actually... Um, all the patterns over here symbolize the duty of a girl in the family. And as we all know, no woman in a family is not a good family. She's always, it has to be the woman to be the one giving us mean, the advice, good advice for actually, um, for how we run things around the family. You know? They are good for that woman. Yep. At one time, missionaries tried to ban tattooing, but it was so deeply embedded in Samoan culture that it never died out. Did you? You're like, you're euphoric. You know, you're just, <laughs> you're kind of glowing with relief and happiness. Yeah, I'm very happy it's over. Just waiting for it to heal. How long will that take? A week. Easy. A week, yes. That's the hard part. I know, <laughs> it is. When you go back over to American Samoa, all your friends are going to be going, oh. Nowadays, it's not really as strong as before. You see a lot of girls go walking around with their mini pants showing their malus because they're proud of it. But tradition in the olden days, you're not allowed to do that. It's just oh, the only day you show your malus when you're dancing in front of guests and right. special occasions. Yeah, it keeps it kind of special. Yeah, yeah. it is. All right, well, I think we should probably let you go and sit down. Yes. Oh, and you probably won't want to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd be in that state of euphoria if someone had been tap tap tapping away at me for four hours. I'd probably be kind of going, ah, oh, ah, 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 ah. But then I'm not overly as strong as a beautiful Samoan woman. A chubby white guy. Samoa's first colonial overlords were the Germans, but all that changed in 1914. When the First World War broke out in Europe, Britain requested that New Zealand seize German Samoa as a great and urgent imperial service. When 1,350-odd New Zealand troops landed here in Apia, there was nary a shot fired. In fact, there's not even a description of anything as unsightly or unseemly as a vigorous discussion ensuing. It was a relatively inauspicious start to what would become a very troubled relationship. New Zealand's colonial rule soon infuriated locals so much that they formed an opposition group called the Mao. On Saturday the 29th of December 1929, the non-violent Mao movement organised a peaceful protest march. New Zealand soldiers tried to arrest a marcher, a fracas ensued, someone panicked and shots were fired. One soldier and 11 Samoans were killed, including the head of the Mao movement. The day became known as Black Saturday. This is the only memorial that I can find to the events of that terrible day, and it's not where you would expect it to be at the scene. It's 
well, some distance away here beside a busy road on the outskirts of Apia. And it's the grave of Te Pua Tamasisi Lealofi III. And you have to wonder, why is there no plaque at the actual scene, at the location of this terrible event? Maybe, I guess, people have chosen not to commemorate it in that way and simply to move on. Sorry, Samoa. One of Samoa's most unique and perhaps most misunderstood cultural phenomena are Fafa Fine. Fafa Fine are, according to the translation of the word, men who live as women. How does someone become a Fafa Fine? Is it chosen by you, for you? You know, is it a conscious decision or is it just something that happens? It's not a club if you're asking me how somebody becomes Did a Fafa Fine. No, no. <laughs> Fafa Fine is, is who you are. You know, the, all these myths about being a Fafafine, you are out of a, a, a family of boys, you were selected to be the Fafa, uh, take up on the female role. No, it's who you, you are born that way. It's like we are part of culture and society in Samoa. You know, some families, it is considered a blessing in some families to have Fafafine because Fafafines can do the best of both worlds. Fafafines are known to be caregivers. You know, it's, it's, as, as I see it, I came back, I used to live in New Zealand and Australia for 20 years. And I came back thinking, oh my gosh, I wonder how it's gonna be like. But when I got back home, everything, I felt like I was home. I felt comfortable who I was. I felt, you know, accepted in society. The Samoan Prime Minister recently stated that Fafafine are glorious miracles of God. Some of them can also put on a glorious drag show, which is no different from any drag show I've ever seen. Garishly entertaining, with a lot of lip-syncing and sexual innuendo. Good fun had by all, including those people picked out for ritual humiliation. I'm popping along to Arpia's big food market to meet expat New Zealander Gretel Jack. Hi, Gretel. How are you doing? Good, and you? Nice day. Well, I'm quite hungry. Oh, good. Yeah. Gretel is a nutritionist who has worked with the Auckland Blues and Manu Samoa rugby teams. Like a game of rugby, this is a market of two halves. On one side, an array of healthy and exotic fruit and vegetables. On the other, cheap, deep-fried fare. As the traditional diet has declined, Samoa has unfortunately developed one of the highest obesity rates in the world. I'd heard that it is not common for someone to live to be in their mid-40s. Um, or is it that it's more common that people in their mid-40s die? Yeah, it's just not that unexpected to, to have a heart attack and die when you in your 40s. Because yeah. I'm nearly in my 40s, I would find that absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Is there, like, is there any sort of campaigns saying to people, hey, look, you know, let's face it, we're killing ourselves with food? Yeah, it's starting to happen. It's definitely on the radar of the health people. <laughs> On my radar. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a long process of, of education and um, behaviour change. It's not easy anywhere. No. I mean, no. you've only got to look at, you know, the first world countries, supposedly. Mm -hmm. People sitting down with, you know, the enormous sort of big fried meals yeah. in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. I've done it. I may even do it later on this afternoon. <laughs> How can it be that something like tinned corned beef can become a cultural delicacy? Well, I think we're all wired for fat and sugar and easy calories, and um, I think the corned beef was pushed pretty hard, but like the mutton flaps and other things from from New Zealand. Yeah. And it, you know, it's oddly tasty, but not that good for you. Not really, no. Especially when you compare it to the traditional diet of the, of the people here. For thousands of years it's been plant-based and lean protein, free-range chickens, fish, lots of seaweed, um, marine protein, and all this wonderful slow-release uh, root vegetables, fresh fruit. Probably one of the best diets in the world, I would imagine. Yeah, I would think so, yeah. yeah. And now Superfoods the... everywhere. One of these superfoods is the odd-looking fruit, the sasalapa. Yeah. It's got a lot of black pips inside, so just get ready to spit them out into your hand, but it's just delicious. That is delicious. I think this is, without a doubt, the juiciest and tastiest fruit I've ever had the pleasure of throwing into my face hole. And the, it's, it's a superfood packed with vitamin C and other goodies. I was at an age where I didn't think I could be surprised by a fruit. 
and I'm I'm absolutely astounded. <laughs> As Gretel says, that carries flavour. So I might just have to sample one of the flavourful, fatty market dishes. Chicken and fish? Yeah. I'll take that one. Eight dollar. Eight dollar? Yeah. I have a feeling he's going to make that hot by re-deep frying it. Uh, yeah. This actually just, it really does get better and better. All right. Oh, thank you. I don't think you get any better flavour than um, twice, at least twice, deep fried chicken. I have the feeling I could be putting my life in mortal danger, but I comfort myself in the knowledge that it is all for the sake of research. A rather pleasant hour-long ferry ride takes me from Upolo to the other major island of Savai. Savai is the larger island, but it has a lot less people. I am currently in the middle of nowhere. Look at this berm, immaculately manicured, next to a road that is also in a state of very good repair. You have to know that a country is doing something pretty phenomenal when you stop and you go, good boom, great road. Good work, Samoa. This is the village of Manasse, and again, it's immaculate. You know what amazes me the most about Samoa? Is how clean it is. Uh, you see, we have a beautification program which is set by the Samoan Tourism Authority. I think it's, it's probably one of the greatest schemes that a country has ever done. So it's working very well for us in Manasse because uh, we're getting some sort of a price, but not much. Yep. It's enough to keep the women's committee doing the work as weeding and keeping and sanding and make sure the banana's up for visitors when they're waiting for the bus. Or, just have a banana. Or they walk to a different village. Why not? Let's have one. Yeah. Oh, a good sun-warmed banana. Yep. They, they call it ladies' fingers. That's why I like them. Mm. Missy Loki. Yeah? Missy Loki. Lady fingers. Yeah. Huh. Well, I've... That's a bloody good lattice finger. To be honest, the one thing I didn't expect to find on Savai was a lava field. And this one is massive. All of this came from an eruption which happened over 100 years ago. And this is the church that lay in the way of the lava flow. You can see the imprint of uh, corrugated iron that was, I guess, once the roof of the church. It's fallen in while the lava was still hot and forever been imprinted there. You can only imagine what people must have thought. You know, here is their church, the lava is coming inexorably towards them, and they would, I guess, have been praying and praying and praying. But I think it takes a lot more than the power of prayer to stop molten magma. The eruption lasted for six years, with the lava slowly engulfing the landscape. Incredibly, no one was killed, but it was clearly very annoying. As the heat of the sun bounces back off the lava, the whole place is a veritable oven. I think you'd have to be something of a lava lover to live here. Jeez. It's a piece of lava. Cooled, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here. Now, ordinarily, that would be a fairly interesting geological fact. What makes it more interesting is the fact that there is a sports field built on top of a field of lava rock. Little surprise that the school's motto is no pain, no gain. Jeez, they must breed some tough little buggers here. Have a look at the try line. And as for the dead ball area, I honestly believe if the ball goes into there, it will die. It is that vicious. Ow. Oh, I'm actually too scared even to run on this field. I'm going to gently walk across it so as not to scrape or stub my toe. One thing Samoa is definitely not short of are coconuts. And this coconut oil processing plant is a new initiative to take advantage of this bounty of the land. It was started a year ago by a Samoan now living in New Zealand to provide work for his old village, where there are virtually no other paying jobs. This is the big oven under here, and you, yeah, use, yeah. The, you use the coconut shells to dry the coconuts. To dry up the coconuts. 
nearly dry. So that's mm. nearly dry, and then that'll mm. just pop out of there. We'll take, take it up from here. And then that goes through the machine, that goes into the pile, mm. gets burned, yes. dries more coconuts. When we dry the coconuts on there, yeah. we bring it there. We bring it through to there. Inside yeah. this room. Right. This guy is working on taking it off. Oh, uh, right. Mm. So these, these are the ones that have been, mm. been dried, and his job is just to take yeah. all of those out of there. So I guess everything depends on whether or not he works fast enough. <laughs> yeah. And this is where all the uh, the real action starts down here. Yeah, the real action for the oil. Go, go through there. Don't get ground up. Mm. You can already feel that that's, uh, that's quite oily. It smells like coconut. For each husked coconut they deliver to this plant, locals get five New Zealand cents. The oil will be sold and used in cosmetics, medicine, and for cooking. A hundred coconuts, how much oil might come out of those? Four or five litres. Four or oh. five litres out of a hundred coconuts, that's a lot of oil. Can I taste the oil? Yeah. Excellent oil. That's good oil. Tastes a lot like oil. Actually more like oil and less like coconut than I'd imagine. Yeah, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be rushing back to drink any of that again soon. Oh, actually, no, that's got quite a nice uh, coconut aftertaste. That is good oil. What's the best thing about having the factory here now? I think this is the easy way for people of our village get some money, yeah. earn some money for what they need. Yeah. Especially on Sunday or church, you know, salmon. Yep. All the money going to church every Sunday. Yeah. Food. Kids for uh, school, oh, that's where they yeah. get money. After mm. school, they can send the kids out and say, go and get some yeah. coconuts. Thank you. Thank you, Wugum. Keep up the good work. I knew there was a lot of coconuts around here that <laughs> had to be used for something. I don't think I've been to a place with more coconut trees than this island, and to think that for all of those years, those coconuts, the majority of them just fell on the ground and were wasted. And to think, people say money doesn't grow on trees. Oh, well, clearly it does. Especially if it's a coconut tree. There's not much to indicate that the Germans were ever in Samoa, apart from the odd Teutonic surname like Schuster or Schmidt. But I'm reliably informed that in the hills behind Apia there is a large lake in which are the descendants of goldfish introduced by a German colonist over 100 years ago. Mountain man Etty has kindly volunteered to take me on the two-hour hike to the lake. I'm just standing here admiring these beautiful cows. Yeah. Aren't they nice? They like staying up here on this level, high level up here. Yeah, it's nice and cool up here. Yeah. All right, I suppose we should get tramping. <laughs> I'll follow you, I guess, seeing as you know the way. OK, I'll just, just follow me. Anyone ever get lost up here? I, I do get lost here sometimes. Uh, but I'm not worried, you know, I, I used to start at night and then the sunshine in the morning, you know, so... Plus, there's no danger. Easy to survive in the bush in Samoa? No problem with it. What did this used to be? This is used to be a, a tower reflect. Oh, for like uh, telephones kind Communication. of thing. Communications. Communications. Yeah. And it was twisted down on 1991 cyclone uh, valve. And now it's just sitting on the ground and I duck a hole under it is my roof. I, I can sleep under this thing. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Under there? Yeah, it's uh, put a couple of mosquito coil in there. Cut a few banana leaves and use it as a mattress and sleep on it. I'm glad there's no snakes or anything on this island. That'd make that a very scary place to go and snuggle up in the middle of the night. Anyway, you can see the power of the cyclone bending there. Yeah, uh, it's so strong. It must be doing about 180 miles per hour, I think. You know. Outrageous, phenomenal. <laughs> Well, wouldn't, wouldn't have wanted to be up here in a storm. No, would have, no. You would have been blown all the way to Tonga. <laughs> you don't want to get caught on a strong wing up here. No. That's why you need to hide under there. <sighs> we are out here at the lake now. Did people used to live up here? Yeah, used to. At the time when they were fighting for independence, this is where the Samoa has to come and stay, and because the New Zealand army were chasing them around. And a guy that was staying up here during the weekend, and he's from Chairman. He brewing in the uh, cold fish. Could probably only have been a German who would look at this lake and think, you know what that lake needs? Goldfish. Goldfish. <laughs> You're like a fish whisperer. Can you call them? 
They're not very hungry, are they? No, they're not. Only those ones from the deep there. They're almost as elusive as any other sign of Germans in Samoa. Because they had big plantations, didn't they, the Germans? Well, yeah, coconut plantation, cocoa plantation in those days. All that's left to do now is to take the two-hour stroll back down the hill. And after such an arduous trek, there's nothing for it but a Samoan massage from who else but Etty's sister, Suzanne. So this is grated coconut. The, the coconut cream's been uh, squeezed out of it, mixed with uh, freshly um, pounded ginger. Oh, it's a little bit like a marinade. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, um, oh, you'll come out with smooth skin. Smooth skin, yeah. and I'll smell like a kind of, like a, a just about to be barbecued steak. Have we got the pot ready? <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was being marinated for a reason. <laughs> All Samoans massage. Everybody used to massage everybody. Must have um, set the missionaries a lot, I would imagine. Well, the missionaries look at it as something very sexual and sensual, so they looked at it as evil. And now they've come back and they're looking for a massage. Yeah. It must have been hard for the missionaries, just, you know, to come down to this beautiful part of the world, you know. I know, I... Beautiful people, and then try to convince them that there was somewhere better than this. Do you believe in Santa Claus? No. See? It's the same with church. Do you mean... <laughs> the white man's God. And I, I have had a lot of massages over the years. Well, I say a lot. Not all that many, but there has never been one that has left me feeling both relaxed and invigorated. And, better still, I smell good enough to eat. Before I came to Samoa, I have to confess I knew virtually nothing about the place. And I was absolutely staggered at its beauty. And I'm not just talking about its natural beauty. There are plenty of places that are naturally beautiful. But I don't think I've ever been to a place that is so immaculately manicured. And there's an enormous sense of pride as you go through every village. And I think that pride is worn not only in the villages, but in the very people themselves. They have a very strong, very resilient culture that has stood the test of time. And they wear it very easily. Pāwhatai, Samoa. I don't know if I said it right, but I said it twice.